to the first workshop. On, this is a workshop on the first day of class. My name is Elizabeth Cohn. I actually go by Betsy, if you're, uh, but in the system I'm Elizabeth Cohn. And I want to let you know that we are going to take the entire 75 minutes. I mention that because that's how I start my first day of class. I tell the students we're going to take the entire class period. And that's important in terms of setting expectations. And so this workshop is really a lot about setting expectations. And as I mentioned to you, I, I sent out an email, and I had mentioned in that email, that this is going to be an interactive workshop, though obviously I'm a professor, I would love to hear myself speak for 75 <laughs> minutes. So the intention for today is uh, first to welcome you and let you know the plan for the day. Then we're going to do introductions, even though this is a very large group. Uh, my, uh, I, would, I thought of the several things to do as far as introductions, recognizing the fact that we won't see each other again as a group. So how important is it for us to know a lot about each other? So that's the, one of the first lessons about introductions that I would say, which is what's your intention? And to me, everything has, I do in the classroom has to have an intention. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is to ask you to state your name and how you're feeling about the fact that Monday is the first day of classes. And I will tell you my intention for doing that, which is we don't often talk about our feelings in the classroom. So it's about taking some risks. And you can do this either in one word or one sentence. You are not allowed to speak more than one sentence because we are a large group. And I want to move on then to, do a, to ask you, what do you do for introductions? And what's your intentions? And I would ask as you, as we're just going around, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll do this as a discussion. I would ask you if someone has already, uh, what I will do is at the end of someone sharing, I will say, who else does that like that? so that we don't have to repeat the same ideas. So the, the intention here is for us to get a lot of different ideas to figure out what works best for you. I do quite a bit of workshops. Uh, I do lots of workshops on teaching. And here's the thing, I, what I always do to start, which is to say, think about how to adopt and adapt whatever is said for you. You have to bring yourself into the classroom. You can't bring myself into the classroom. I do what works for me. And uh, I made that mistake very early on in my career as a teaching assistant for a brilliant man named Nick Onuf, who used to teach in SIS. And I tried to be like Nick. It was a disaster. I couldn't. So you have to be who you are. And then we'll do a very quick brainstorming on student, the student information sheet which is what information would you want on that and why? And then finally, we will move to different exercises that uh, you might do on the first day of class beyond the introductions and reviewing the syllabus, okay? So, as I just to, uh, any questions on the plan? So uh, one other thing I'd like to say is, as a piece of housekeeping, which is that I did set up a Blackboard site, and I posted some things there. I have the most, uh, I, I have two of them that I have copied, which I will hand out at the end, because otherwise you would be reading them instead of listening to each other. One is a first day of quotes, uh, first day of class quotes exercise, and the other is just some other class exercise having to do with student learning. So that's here for everybody. Okay, what else do I have here? The final thing, final thing I will say is I do hope that everyone will take one idea. I've been to a lot of workshops on teaching and I get all excited. And it's like, I'm gonna do all these things, I'm gonna change everything. And then I get back to my office and reality sets in and I feel overwhelmed, and the deadlines are coming, and I don't do anything. So I would ask you to just take one idea, if you can, just think about it, and to adopt it. And that's what I did with the first day of class quotes from last year's Ann Farron conference that someone suggested. So. 
Okay. So can we go around and can I ask everybody to introduce themselves? But here's something else that I do, which is I get over, I get out into the classroom, what I would call the low-hanging fruit first. I want to know, so let's uh, do this by way of um, which teaching unit are you from? I want people to raise their hands when I, and look around so that you can identify who else might be from your teaching unit that you might want to seek out later because they're interested in teaching. Okay, so who is from CAS? Raise your hand. Okay, look around. Look around. Because you're going to see if you'll remember a face more than you'll remember a name, right? We're in that age bracket, most of us. S SOC. All right. <laughs> COGOD. Hi, COGOD. SPA. Look around. SIS. S SPX. How do you say that? Specs. Specs. Thank you. I knew that. Specs. Anyone from Specs? WCL, the law school. Welcome. And uh, did I miss anybody? Seth. Seth. Of course, Seth. Are you Jill? No. Kim. Kim. And you're Jill. See, I know that because they posted to Blackboard. They already get in with the professor. <laughs> All right? You can tell that to your students, right? You get to know. Yes? Human resources. Human resources. Anyone else from human resources? <laughs> All right. And the law school, we had one in the back. All right. So we go through it. And is there anything else sort of that you would want to know as a group, as a collective group, who we are? Okay, how many of you teach only undergraduates? Interesting, raise your hand, look around. How many of you teach only graduate students? Okay, how many teach both? Okay, anything else you would want to know? A visiting scholar. Are there any other visiting scholars? Raise your hand if you're a visiting scholar. Welcome. <laughs> All right. I'm from College Park, University of Ah, anyone from uh, another university? College Park. Okay. I wondered if someone would ask that. How many are adjuncts? How many are full time? And do we want any other distinctions? How many are graduate students? Okay, so we have a real mix of people. I would also, I mean, I might ask, how many are feel that they, feel that they are new to teaching? Okay. How many feel old and tired? <laughs> All right. So. I do this in my introductions with my students where I say, how many of you are first year, second year, third year, fourth year? We get it out of the way. How many of you are SIS, SPA, SOC? Because that's often how students will introduce themselves. You know, I'm, I live in Let's. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> Maybe the other students need to know that, but they should know that on their off time because it's not really going to help unless they're going to form a study group only with people from Let's. So I do the how many studied abroad? because I'm from SIS, so a lot of people study abroad. So we get all the low-hanging fruit out of the way quickly so that we can then get to something that's more interesting. So, all right, can we do this? So we do this very quickly, which is your name and how you're feeling about the first day of class. It can be one word or a whole sentence. My name is Selena Ryan, and I'm excited for the first day of class. My name is Michelle Lansigan. I'm also excited, but somehow anxious as well. <laughs> My name is Oranje Rodriguez, and I feel nervous and excited too. Let's 
Stephanie Fisher uh, would like to be more prepared than I am right now. <laughs> and could you look at the whole group, maybe stand up just real fast so that people can see who you are. Okay, my name is Susana Marin. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel excited too. I'm Esther Holterman, and I'm excited to see the new faces in the classroom. Hi, I'm Kathleen Smith, and I have a two and a half hour class on Monday, and I'm wondering what I'm going to do for two and a half hours. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren McGrath. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm Nishi Ibrahim, and I'm very relaxed because I don't have to teach this semester. <laughs> but you're willing to help those of us who still haven't finished our syllabi. What's your field? It's uh, the School of Communication. Okay. Yes, go on. I'm Mandy Janice, and I'm excited for next week. I'm Ned Malone, and I am feeling humbled because I've never taught before. My name's Belen Lowry. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about the first day. I'm Sam Guthrie, and I'm feeling very unprepared about next week. I'm Erin Carnes, and I'm thrilled because it's going to be my last first day of class as a student. <laughs> I'm Amy Ruddle, and I'm optimistic. I'm Kent Chadwick, and I feel that I'm already behind somehow. <laughs> awesome. I'm Muhammad Ada. I'm uh, very excited. <laughs> I'm Emma Fawcett. I'm excited that this is my first semester without being a student myself um, and looking forward to meeting new students. I'm Emmanuel Addo and I'm excited because I want to try some new things. I'm Sonia Walty and I'm glad I teach on Tuesdays and not Mondays. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Beth Bruns. Uh, I'm a little stressed but not because I'm teaching this semester but because I'm grading finals from last semester. Hi, I'm Catherine Lamro, and I'm from the Department of State, the Foreign Service Institute. So I'm excited for you all on Monday because your students might eventually become ours. Larry Schrank, I've taught for a long time, but still have a few butterflies. <laughs> I'm Mary Agnes Rogers. I may or may not be teaching, so I'm a little intrigued by whether I will have a class this year or not, and very intrigued by the backgrounds of the students. So I look forward to that. Hi, I'm Philip Okot. Um, I'm really excited to meet the new students. Hey, I'm Kate Tennis. I'm also excited for the first day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm Catherine Stilley, and I wish we had at least another week. I'm Zara. I echo Catherine's uh, sentiment, and I'm going to try my hardest not to be jaded. <laughs> I'm Jeff Adler. I'm feeling a combination of excitement and a decreasing sense of nervousness. Hi, I'm John. Sorry. Hi, I'm John Hyman, and I'm more nervous than I was the first time I taught a first class in 1978. <laughs> my name is Nicole Orfanides, and I'm excited because it's my last semester of grad school. <laughs> I'm Aline Gelbard. I'm relaxed because I'm not teaching until a few months from now this semester. My name is Preeti Brahma, and I'm excited, but I'm also looking forward to it being over. I'm Jesse Myler, and I'm excited to be teaching a new class. I'm Mara Doherty, and I'm very unprepared. <laughs> um, I'm Sabrina Kramer, and we actually have two more weeks left before our classes start. Yes, we have a winter term. So, um, but this is my first time co-teaching, so it's a lot more work than it looks like. So I feel like I have a lot more work to do. I'm Jill Robinson, and I am relaxed because I do have an extra week. My block class doesn't start till next Friday. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rogério Naresi, and I'm excited and nervous as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Scott Patrick, and after uh, a year and a half of TAing, I think I'm finally in the hang of it. So. Kim Tilly, and like Jill, mine starts on Wednesday, which makes me happy. I'm Jean from China. If uh, it is a first day for my class, I will tell, uh, tell my, uh, uh, tell my uh, uh, students, uh, hello, it's a nice to meet you. Um, enjoy your class and what? Hi, I'm Catherine Gillespie, and um, 
I'm feeling uh, a little anxious because I just got into Blackboard this morning for the first time, and it just says I have no classes. But um. <laughs> Blackboard is not working quite right. Oh, okay. I just right, spoke good. with Lynn Stallings, who is the vice provost for undergraduate studies, and she said the class rosters, the classes aren't up. It's a problem. I'll show up on Tuesday anyway. But <laughs> you do have classes, those of you. I'm Laura Gibson. I am not teaching or TAing this semester, but I am looking forward to the first day of class because it's a course that I've been looking forward to for years that I finally get to take. So that's good. My name is Michelle Gross, and it feels a little weird after going around the whole room, but I'm, I'm actually kind of indifferent about the semester starting. Maybe it just hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm Ann Bleiberg. I'm nervous, but I've done a lot of teaching, and I know I should be nervous before my first day. Um, I'm Thomas Nassif, and I, um, I'm still laughing at myself for falling on the ice today, and not hurting myself, but just looking like an ass. I'm Susan Agalini. I'm really excited to meet my new students and see some of my old students. Under interrogation, I've been highly trained to only provide name, rank, and serial number. So Chris Tudge, Associate Professor of Biology, 1101164. I'm unprepared, but I'm confident I can get there. All right. And I am Elizabeth Cohn, and I'm excited and a little panicked because I have three different syllabi to prepare, and only one is done. So we had one person who came in late. We're introducing ourselves by your name, and how you feel about the first day of class. My name is Winfield Wilson, and I can't wait. All right. So let's do a little check-in, which is that took uh, about seven minutes. What did you think of that exercise as a way to introduce ourselves? I thought it was nice to get the temperature of different people, so I would know how to kind of tailor what I'm saying to different people and know what's going on in the room. Okay. Anyone else? I liked it more than I thought I would, and I, I think it's great for other people to learn how other people are feeling, because I assume that everybody else is totally together and I'm not, so I like hearing. Anybody else? It made me laugh a lot, which kind of lightened the mood, I think. So that was really positive. One of the intentions. Kathleen actually took one thing I was going to say, but the other thing is it provides a safe space for the student who's just pathologically shy. Her voice gets heard. Anybody else? I want to know a little more information about why the student is, is taking the class. Um, I'm wondering if if you meant making it explicit what your intention from this was would help or not. Uh, let me answer that question before I ask. That's a, I go back and forth on that, which is that I often do tell the students what my intentions are because it helps them buy in or at least understand where I'm going because there usually is a method to my madness. and. I did say to us that we were only going to be together for 75 minutes and not a whole semester, right? And so why do we need to know everything about each other and what our ex why do we need to know what our area our, our area of research is? This is a class this is a workshop on teaching. So I intentionally didn't ask for that information. When I do my student so before I get to how I do it how I do it in the classroom uh, we will do that when we uh, get to this next question, which is how do you do introductions in the classroom? I hesitated to even do introductions because I thought, there's 70 people signed up for this workshop. Is it going to be a waste of time? And I thought, you know, we, I, we're not going to remember all the names. So it's not like I'm going to be able to say, you know, I can, I finally, you know, it's like Jill and Kim, I got that because I had a prep, you know, some uh, preface work here, but 
what I wanted to do was to make everybody sort of wake up a little bit and get their focused on the fact that we are here all together to think about teaching and what the first day of class brings. And I thought it probably will take about five to ten minutes at most, and I, and I thought we could do that and use that time. But I hesitated even to do that. So uh, initially I was going to just skip uh, any kind of speaking on your part. And then I thought, no, pet, I'm trying to model what we do in the, what I do in the classroom, and that would be the wrong message to give. So I tried to think of something that could be quick and expose the way in which we feel it would be a risk-taking for faculty who don't often bring their authentic selves and their, and their feelings into a classroom. So that's why I did it that way. Anyone have anything else to say? I'm glad you did it because as an adjunct, I wanted to know who else was in the same school that I'm in and who was in other schools, so it was helpful. It's interesting you say that because I actually thought for a moment, maybe I should have people meet, sit with, ask them to get up and sit with people in their units. Because one of the things we've done in SIS starting last summer is that a group of faculty and staff get together in a study group every other week just on teaching. And we started reading Parker Palmer's book, The Courage to Teach. And now we're moving on to other readings as well. And we're reading John Dewey. And we read short articles during the semester when we don't have time to read. But we still get together as a learning community about teaching. And I thought maybe I, I had people sit together and when we do a small group, they would be with people of their unit. And then I thought, mm, some people might not want to be with <laughs> members of the no. unit, or maybe it wouldn't be meaningful. So I thought, mm, I don't think I need to do that. But that's why I had people raise their hands quickly. So, and I asked you to look around. I noticed not everyone did. But I asked you to look around so that you would be able to seek people out. And what I want to do at the end is to give you a, a few minutes to go around and, and meet the people that you want to exchange contact information with to continue talking about teaching. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about what do you do for introductions in your classroom and why. Who would like to start us off? So, sure. so this isn't something that I've done, but something that I saw done and thought worked really well, especially for a large class. The first day of class, the professor asks students to create a short PowerPoint slide with a photo of themselves, and then information in terms of um, kind of what major you're in and kind of the typical stuff that students often give, which worked out well for a large class. And then every day for the first few weeks of class, he'd show two or three slides. So people could put things that, like which dorm they're in or where, they tr where they're from. I remember what the professor had us put on. It was something like your name, which school you're from, your major, what year you are, and activities, hobbies, fun stuff about you. Were those posted to Blackboard or to a site where people could look at them? Um, he, the professor then showed two or three slides each day for the first basically week or two of class. I can't remember whether he put them on Blackboard or not. Because you could put them all as one Blackboard slide, uh, back Blackboard presentation, one PowerPoint presentation on Blackboard, and then everybody would have that on the class uh, site. All right. Um, here's, now here's a question for you. Should we continue to ask questions about this exercise? This exercise? We'll allow, I'll allow maybe two more questions or comments on this exercise. Uh, I have a question because there are many students. I wonder, uh, is it useful um, uh, if the first day the, uh, the professor uh, introduced uh, like that, that, like a way, is it, uh, use, is it useful? I want to know uh, the opinion in, uh, of the uh, uh, the opinions from students. To introduce themselves. Yeah, is yes. is it well, useful? Yes. Well, I actually that's a, a failing on my part, which is we're going to talk about uh, sort of other things on how to introduce the syllabus and and that's um, what I will uh, I'll interrupt here my plan here and say, which is, I do not go through the entire syllabus, all right? Why? It, it's important to introduce yourself. At, when we do introductions, 
I also introduce myself in the same way and give a little bit more background uh, in terms of why the students should be spending all their time and money with me, essentially. So yes, I think it's important to introduce yourself. I don't spend a lot of time on the syllabus because I watched, as John said to me in an email, I watched, I did that, and I watched the air just get sucked out of the room. And I just saw them feeling so overwhelmed, and I thought about it. I just talked about 14 weeks worth of material that took me about 10, 15 years to learn, and I'm just throwing it all out at them as if they're somehow going to absorb all that. And so I don't do that anymore. What I do is to give some highlights of the syllabus, some of the themes that we address in the course, and I then focus on the assignments and why these assignments, what they are going to get out of it, because that's really what they also want to know. And then what, and I spend a lot of my time going over course policies because they have, if they're undergraduates, five different courses. If they're graduates, they have three different courses. That's like having five or three different bosses. They have to figure out who I am, what the rules are, and how I'm going to conduct the class. And then I, but I also try to model that in the first day of class. That's what I think is important, is to model however you are going to conduct your class. And I, hopefully, it will be in an engaged way. And I do believe lecturing can be engage, engaging, right? So what I do is to um, where is it? Uh, go over the course policies. And I posted my course policies on our Blackboard site so that you would see what they are. And I wanted to maybe have a conversation about that at the end because that's like a whole other workshop. But I think it's an important one about laptops, about attendance, and all sorts of other things that I've started to talk to faculty about, OK? So that an I th uh, the answer, short answer is yes, I think it's important for the faculty to answer, to introduce themselves. All right. Can we go back to how you do introductions? So like I said, this is my first time teaching, but I have seen introductions done well and done poorly. Um, I think one thing that often hinders helpful introductions is when the professor asks the students to tell us like 10 different things about themselves. And so the students are actually just spending the whole time trying to remember all the things that they're supposed to say and they're worried about not missing anything. So I would keep uh, introductions down to just maybe a few facts and maybe even write it on the board so they don't have to think, what was I supposed to say? They can just see what they're supposed to say. I've seen it work well and I'm planning to do in my first date where you pair up students and they introduce each other to and then they have to introduce their partner to the class because it takes away that hit the list and this is my interpretation. How many do that? That's a very popular one. What I would ask is do you give any guidance? As yeah, I mean, I'm, pla you would want them to learn. I'm planning to have like a PowerPoint slide. Here's the things, because I also want to collect a card or something that has that, but not to just have the student read for themselves. Okay. I'm just going to tack on by saying I guide them a little bit by saying they have to find five things that they have in common and share those. And they only have three minutes. <laughs> okay, it's three minutes, and you have to find five things you have in common. I like that because it's about building connections among the, the class, okay? Oh, and they can't be uh, what their width body, it, it can't be about their body or anything like that. It I got that in parent last year, yeah. It can't be about your body. It's meaning like you know, both have heads and eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I used to warn the students in advance, before day one, of what kind of introduction I would ask them to do, just something very simple, uh, name where you're from, where you hope to be going, and maybe something about yourself that we would never guess but that you don't mind revealing. Uh, now I'm using Piazza. I would never recommend that someone use a tool like this just for the purposes of introductions, but if you are using such a thing already, then 
uh, it's very easy to say, before, please introduce yourself here. And I just ask the same questions. The only difference is I say, uh, please tell us how to pronounce your name if it's not obvious. Uh, I have a, a sort of a, a ground zero question. Bef I'm wondering when to do these in in introductions because every year I do it the first day of class and by the second week, third of the class is different. Different people, d they haven't heard the first introductions, the syllabi. Um, I don't go over it again, so uh, my TA and I get loads of people and they never know. So this year I was planning to go straight into lecture. You guys can read the syllabus, uh, know general factors, and see uh, if you want to stay in the class or not. And then the second week, first day of second week, I would do the introductions. So I'm wondering if that's a good idea or not. Anybody have reactions to that? Yeah. Um, if you have people introduce themselves online, then anyone who joins the class late can immediately see uh, everyone else's introduction. They can read them in just a couple of minutes, and they can add their own. I never do that. I spend zero time on the syllabus directly. I teach basic finance, which is a required course, of which 80% of the students don't want to be there. Uh, so my ulterior motive in introductions is my feeling that the more I know about students, I ask about internships and majors and things like that, the more I can try and connect what they're interested in with the subject they don't want to learn about. I started this uh, semester with uh, using Piazza for students to introduce themselves. And I love it because they, they tell me a little bit, and I ask them about the expectation of the class. So I teach basic statistics. I see those who are fear, they are afraid of math, and I try to navigate, and I try to answer every single uh, response. What is uh, Piazza? Piazza is the, uh, it's like a discussion board, but an upgraded form of discussion post, and we have it incorporated in our blackboard. And so you let them know that everybody in the class is reading what they are posting, and I try to find connections to everything that they say. Where you are from, if I've been there before, I try to respond in that tone. So I try to find links to whatever they say to me in Piazza, and it, it's working wonderful. I think that's a great idea in the sense that sorry, that it takes people to Blackboard also. And it allows for more interaction. What it doesn't do is then create a dynamic. I mean, for what it's worth, even in the seven minutes, there was a dynamic that I think I created with everybody sharing and laughing and exposing themselves a little bit. So I also would like to, I at least would like to see something that says, you matter. You count. I'm not the only one who's going to be doing the speaking in the classroom. However you do that on the first day of class, it doesn't have to be introductions uh, and who you are. But it is a way to, uh, I think it's very important to have the students speaking. Now, not everyone agrees with that. There's some who say, and, and it also is about setting up expectations. I would um, agree with what you just said because I uh, routinely teach a class of 150 and there are classes of 200 and 300 in economics and you can't do any sort of interactive thing like that. That's your whole first 75 minutes gone. Um, and I would even say that if they posted comments on Blackboard, no student's going to sit there and read 150 of them. So great, uh, great idea for smaller classes. You've got to come up with something a little different, I think, for really large classes. So what do you do? Uh, well, I don't do any introductions like that. I tell them who I am and I do a short introduction, um, and uh, I don't think it's necessary for that person on that side of the room to know what that person in that corner of the room is. Um, it's impossible to really do that connection with 150 people in the classroom. So that raises the question of large classes. Does anyone else teach 150 class size classes, and what do you do? Do you also adopt the lack of, uh, do you not do introductions? I can. Yeah, like we don't do anything, and I, I agree with that, that, that perspective that, you know, there really is no point for one person way over there to know the other person over there. And it's in a required course, so like the, the other person said, they don't even really want to be there. There's, there's not a whole lot of motivation to make connections anyway. It's an undergraduate course. Uh, they may not need to e know each other, but I 
think I would ask them to write something so that I know something about them. So it's just a one-on-one, -on -one, the hub of the wheel kind of thing. That leads us into a discussion of student information sheets, which I'm happy to move into if we feel like we're done with introductions. Well, I teach a large course, and I use an interactive system called Top Hat that they can, it's kind of like a amped up clicker system. And so I say, how many of you are freshmen, how many of you are sophomores, and they, they log in with their phones or their laptops, or they can text in. And so that's a way of getting at the information without actually going individually for 130 kids or 150 kids. I like that because it also does send a message that they will be uh, expected to be in the class and that they're a member of the class. Usually several times during the course of a lecture I have them weigh in via this system. And it does keep them on their toes because when you have a very big lecture theater, there's just like this kind of collective sigh that happens every 15, 20 minutes and you've got to get them back <laughs> somehow. I saw some other hands. So I've taught upwards to about 250 before. And um, for my large lectures, everyone sits in the same place. Even, even it doesn't matter how many people are in there, they always sit in the same place. So I do introductions for the four or five people that they're sitting around. And I do a bunch of think pair shares. So they're going to see the same people over and over again. So while I one person on one side of the class, it doesn't matter for the 75th person over there, but that's what I do. And I would hope that that would lead to study groups. I would encourage with them. Hope. Yes, <laughs> we can hope. We can always hope. But we can plant that idea, which is that it's the intention to uh, form study groups. And if you hear somebody ask a question that you find interesting, go change your seat in a few weeks so that you can then start to, to learn about them and study with them. Yeah, I've never taught or TA'd for a large class, but I think doing something like that and perhaps having them sit with, you know, everyone that lives in their dorm or, you know, all the dorm A, dorm B, commuters, whatnot, would that, do you guys think that would work well in terms of, you know, these are faces that they're going to see more regularly outside of class and it's a lot easier to have a study group with people that you don't have to leave the building or put on your, you know, real clothes <laughs> to actually get together with? I'm just curious. I would ask for a show of hands. How many think it's best to have the students sit by location of where they live, like by dorm or commuter. Does anyone think that's a good idea? Yeah. Or by some commonality. OK. All right, anyone, anyone else have any ideas on introductions? Let's do one more. I only work with smaller groups, but um, I use Appreciative Inquiry, which is by Cooper Writer. Um, and that's pulling out a strength of each of the students. So what is a strength that you bring to this room? And it empowers the students. It makes the energy higher and work gets done. I like that. The risk-taking thing would be to add and what's one thing you think you need to improve? And find the person who you, know, you should be paired with if you need to learn how to. But that's a risk taking, because it's asking some student to expose their weakness on the first day of class. And how many of us are willing to do that the first time you meet somebody? So I think that that depends. Which, so let me tell you, which is there's also, I do something with a course, with the introductions. I relate it to the course content. So sometimes I will do. Tell us, I change it up basically to keep myself interested, and it also depends on the class. Then how many students are in it, what level of the class. So uh, I will ask, tell us something about yourself that will help us remember who you are. And that's just sort of, that, that's what I do as far as the general something about yourself. And the example I give is a student, Whitney, who, told, who was from Houston. And I still remember, you know, Whitney from Houston, right? Whitney Houston. Uh, that wasn't her last name. But I still remember that. Or the kid who was struck by lightning when he was nine. I mean, it gets, and what I do is I, when I do that, I will ask, these are in small classes of 30 or below. I will ask if I, uh, one question about each student. So it gets a dialogue going or some interest. In a smaller class, I will, will let them, like in an honors class, I will let them ask questions of each other. 
and it gets a conversation going, and it's, it's about creating a learning community and accountability to each other. But more often what I do is something related to course content, so, and it relates back to the student information sheet. I have them fill out a student information sheet, which I've posted some to Blackboard on our site. And for example, in the foreign policy class, I'll say, uh, one of the questions is, what do you think are the most pressing foreign policy problems? Or I ask career goals. What do you want to, you know, top three choice? Or there's also what courses have you taken or knowledge that do you bring into the classroom? And I have them fill that out first, and then we do introductions, and I'll just say, share something off the student information sheet. So it gives them a chance to choose what risk level they want to take. Though we've already gone through the, I'm a junior, you know, I live in Lentz, or whatever it is, okay? <clears throat> More risk taking. I teach a class on transitional justice. I have the, it's all about wrongdoing and how societies respond to that wrongdoing. It's a senior seminar, 19 students, I'll ask them, and I tell them this question at the very beginning of class so that they have time to think. I think that's really important. I ask them, give us an example where you were wronged and what happened, or an example where you wronged somebody and what happened. And that gets them into the course content. But you, I only can do that, and it's a way of creating because we start to deal with you know, rape and torture and violations and all sorts of things. And uh, so it, it's a very intense course and it's a way to quickly build. Good question about the info sheets. Um, <coughs> do, you, do you hand them out in the beginning of class and they do that first? Sorry, you, I'm sorry, I, did, I just, yeah, I didn't want this. So what I do is uh, I introduce my, um, at the very beginning, this is how it goes. I introduce myself, I hand out the syllabus, <laughs> I then just talk about course policy, or the, I hand out the syllabus and give them five minutes or more to read it. There's no reason that I need to read aloud. They can read. Many of them have already read it because it's been posted on Blackboard for between 10 minutes and, <laughs> and 12 hours. <clears throat> then, so after I've given them time to read the syllabus, I go over the course policies and the themes of the course. Then I have them fill out the student information sheet. Then we do introductions. Then I collect the student information sheet at the end. The other thing, one last thing I do is I have them, since I don't want it to be a professor-centered classroom, I want it to be a learning community where we're all involved. After every fourth student, we have to, everyone has to say their name aloud, the names aloud. So, uh, it, you know, we j just because I can only remember four, and I write it down, and I say to them, you might want to write this down unless you remember, you know, names really well. And so every fourth time we say those four names, and I'm sending the message that I want them to learn each other's names. And when they comment in class discussion, it's not just, well, what she said. It's like, no, what did Laura say? You know, you have to, I want them to address Laura by name. So. Again, it's for an intention. And I also, every single time, I met, usually they mumble through the first four. And I'll say, okay, that was pathetic. And everybody laughs. So I can, I, again, it's something easy to sort of call them on. So I can say, I'm, I'm paying, you know, I want you to really pay attention to this course. So everything is with an intention. So you have to adopt it to whatever works for you. Anne. And good to see you, Anne. I knew Anne 30 years ago. That's right. Um, I have a question because I, have, I haven't taught in an academic context before, just in acti with activists in different countries. And I always send out a questionnaire ahead of time to get information. Is, am I unrealistic to think that I can do that here? With graduate students, I would say you might be able to get, I think, with, um, my impression is you might get about 60 to 70 percent compliance. Anybody else? Um, I mainly teach graduate students, and they're pretty good about getting it. And, and at least even getting the bulk of it is helpful. But the one thing, and I picked up from the conference that I put on the student introduction form, 
Um, they don't share it with the class. It's just information for me initially. And the line that I put on there that has been incredibly mm -hmm. helpful is um, because my class is small, it's very interactive, class participation is critically important. And I say, is there anything you would like to share with me about your ability to participate in class? And what's been very helpful is I find out if there are learning issues. I also found out that students are incredibly shy. And because I do call on students, but I can work out something with them to let them know I'm going to. And it, it makes it safe for them. I think that's fantastic. And Kim, you posted that to the Blackboard site so everybody can see that. Um, I, to, your, to your question, Anne, I just did that for um, a grad class I'm teaching, but I linked it with, I'm gonna use this information to assign you to the correct team. And I think you know the students that are interested in NGOs versus security issues, um, they, there's something in it for them to make sure they're in the right team. Yeah. I would want, how many of you at the graduate level, when you ask students to introduce themselves, it's a v much more professional sort of where, where have you worked or what contacts? How many people do that? Yeah, I, I would think that. It's tough because some people don't have a lot of work experience and it can make them feel not as important. That's right, yeah. so that is the risk there. So I of, what I always do in that sense, it's where have you worked or where would you like to work? What's your dream job? Because it is about networking, and so it might be a way for somebody to, oh, we're hiring, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing. No, I've seen that in my class. The introduction sheet I also do on Blackboard and uh, using a blog, and I'll use Piazza, thanks to other hints here, because um, I want them to go to Blackboard. So it's, it's an ulterior motive for me to get them to go there. And I think that's the key here, which is what is your intention? What do you want to set up for your class? And, and that's the first day is the way to do it. Kate. Um, I wanted to share, I TA'd for Professor Bosco this past semester for world politics. And one thing that um, we did for the students on the first day, so I did an info sheet with sort of who are you, blah, blah, blah. And on the back I said, tell me one thing that you think is true of world politics. And the students were like, oh, that makes no sense. This is so frustrating and I don't like this at all. But they all turned something in and it ended up being a great tool. I brought them in in chunks. Um, so all the folks who said, you know, it, to, to reflect the theories that we were teaching, right? And it turned out that what people gave us was like, world politics is all about conflict, really fit with you know, a certain theoretical framework that I was trying to teach and it empowered them and it linked them to theory which is otherwise horrible and dry and they hate it. Um, so I found that really useful actually. Well, some of them love it, but a lot of them hate it and it helped when I was like, oh, well, Michael, who's sitting here looking really bored, already gave me a statement about this being true of world politics. So that was helpful. Well, I'll follow up on that one thing. I uh, one thing I did in a uh, course, like when I taught IR theory on the first day of class, I just asked them, draw, I said, draw your picture of the world. And I got everything from the globe with geographic areas to the United Nations and flags pl plugged in there to um, someone drew the infinity sign and what I did was then to use that, this is an exercise I did, which is course related, course content related. I then used that to show the levels of analysis, whether you're looking at the individual, the state, the global system. So it's, so I wanna use that as an opportunity to move into, I'm gonna, mm, in the interest of time, maybe start with the exercises, which I think might be more useful because student information sheets uh, can just be posted to Blackboard. So I just gave you an example where I you asked them to draw their picture of the world. I didn't say map, but it was related to course content. It was also a way for me to assess where they, what their thinking is and where they are, and it was a way to pull out a key theme of the course, which is where we're going to deal with this level of analysis problem. Who would like to share an exercise that they do that uh, might be helpful to people? Um, I, I sometimes on the first day of class ask, sorry, ask students to write a quick review of the class oh, as if it were the end of the semester. If you want. Um, so I say to them, it's not January 13th anymore, it's May 1st, we've been at this for three months, tell me what you thought of the class, 
And then here's the kicker. Everybody to my left, you thought this class was terrific. Everybody to my right, you were grossly disappointed. Tell me why. It gets the fears on the page, the people who say, oh, I was disappointed because this happened. Well, now we're collectively agreed that we ought not let that happen, whatever the that was. Um, it, it allows people to um, uh, express their felt anxieties. Um, and frankly, we laugh at some of the results. It gets some laughter on the, on the, uh, uh, on the table the very first day. Great idea. Great suggestion. Anybody else? Any other exercises that you do? Can I share one? Yes, yeah. Ivana. I, I think the most exciting exercise I have done was the second time I taught introduction to microeconomics. I had my students, like, I always do a game of participation so that they see that participation comes from something, not just from coming to class. So I ask them questions, and if they get a good answer, they get points. But I started doing it in groups, and they took it really seriously. <laughs> and when I wanted to say, no, this second round, we're not going to do the groups, they were fighting me. They were saying, like, no, we want the groups. And they were all in, a, in kind of round tables in the classroom, and they debated the answers. So all the teams were competing, and I started doing it as, in, as incentive point after I, they had accumulated participation. So it was fantastic. These students were all talking about economics all together, like, no, this is not the right answer. This is the wrong, or this is the perfect. Can you give so, an example? So I just asked them, I had, like, clickers. So in the, mater in the with the textbook I was using, I had, like, slides with the questions. And they had, like, selections. So they had four possible answers. And I will say, okay, group one, this is your chance. And they had, like, one, two minutes to give me an answer. They will just whisper, come closer, try to debate, and tell me, okay, it's answer A. And I will say, why? You need to explain and all that. And if they had it wrong, then I gave the opportunity to another group to do the same thing. So it, it was just pretty exhilarating how they were taking it. Yeah? Any questions on that exercise? So was this content that they were later going to learn? Yes. So, so, like so this was after every chapter or every three, every three chapters, I just say, OK, today there's no lecture. We're just doing participations. So the entire session was one hour, 15 minutes of like questions. And they had that, like their groups. And so, so on. but on the first day, no. no. On no. the first day, I had oh, introductions. The first day. On the first day, I okay. had introductions and like tense for them. Okay. And the tense lasted like the two or three weeks, which helps a little bit with the questions that people were saying, "What if they drop out or not?" Right. So I just helped them like keep introducing themselves each, each time. Yeah. Uh, something related to that. I have a colleague. I was asking him, "What does he do on the first day of class?" He gives a quiz, and he p just posts questions on the board. It's not like it's just, and he has them write down the answers. And some of it's more conceptual, like what is uh, the problems with biodiversity? Or some of it might be factual, sort of uh, how many people are there in the world? What's, you know, what's the world's population? And so they're both conceptual and factual. He collects them, and it's ungraded. And then he saves them, and he hands them back to them the last day of class. And then they see how much they've learned. I thought that was fabulous. I thought it was a great idea that I might use. But I think it would be important. It's, I, have I have questions about that as far as mentioning that it's ungraded. <laughs> or I would say, I'm just trying to learn what you know or get a sense of what you know. If you say things are ungraded, the literature says they don't try as hard. Uh, so I would just say, I'm just trying to get a sense of where you are and to assess where the class is. So do your best on this and don't worry about it. This is not a stressful exercise, but I just want to see what your knowledge base is coming in. One of the things that I do on the first day of class is to sell the, the topic that I'm teaching, the, the course that I'm, I'm, I'm teaching. And I try to use some movies that they are familiar with or come up with some philosophical statements about statistics and why is computers or 
our cell phones always close to us because they deliver some form of information and I try to connect that to basic statistics. So I try to, you know, get them engaged into the course that I'm about to teach them and when I get that, it creates a very uh, good atmosphere for me to be able to move on from the day forward. Uh, don't talk under that. Okay. So I think that's a great idea to show, to do, make some connections. You can even, even ask them to read a short newspaper article and respond to it. I have shown videos. I've shown like a 20 minute video. Uh, and then at, in a two and a half hour block class. Maybe we should move on to specifically two and a half hour block classes. Because that is, I just hate to lose that learning opportunity. So I've done different things. Something like that where you uh, share with, you know, have them talk about sort of the everyday life aspects of the course content. I've shown a video and then asked them to comment or have a discussion if it's a provocative kind of a, an excerpt of a video. Uh, another example that I, met, I posted, posted to Blackboard, which is uh, called First Day of Class Quotes. And I learned this last year at the Ann Farron Conference from a colleague of mine who's a PhD student in SAS, uh, Ella Ross Miller. And this is something she suggested. So I wrote it up and I, I did it immediately and I've done it since. Which is I go through my course material and I pull out key quotes. Something that has to do, that's something that's provocative. And I include the author's name. And the ones I give as an example here are, for example, in a course that I did called Reflections, U.S. in the Mirror. I have quotes here Europe by Ma Maggie Thatcher. Europe was created by history. America was created by philosophy. Or Alexis de Tocqueville. I know of no country in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom of discussion as in America. And so on. I have, uh, on the handout I have for you, I have five different quotes. And I give each student one quote, and I break them up into groups of four. And the, their instruction is to come up with as many questions as possible about these quotes. So I'm not trying to get them to give answers. That's what the course is for. But I want them to be engaged, to get excited, to ask questions about these quotes. And one of the quotes, questions last year, uh, year was, um, I don't know who this Alexis, I don't know who she is, this Alexis de Tocqueville. <laughs> well, that told me something about what their knowledge base is. And so I knew where to also enter into the conversation. So it also is really helpful. It's also great as I sit and I go around the room and I listen to their conversations to see who's you know, speaking frequently and maybe dominating, who's less comfortable speaking, so that I already see that on the first day. And I found this to be very helpful. And the students later in the semester, when we got to their, they remembered their quote as if it was their quote. You know, it's like their penny or something. And so when we would get to it in the readings, they're like, yeah, no, I remember that and what we said about this. So I was, you know, it wasn't just a sort of exercise to use time. Anything that seems like busy work to you is going to seem like busy work to them. And so I just think it's really important that whatever you do, it's for this uh, with some intention. The class I teach is uh, basically is teaching special education to teachers. And so there's one activity we do the first day where I give them a profile of a classroom and then I identify kids with learning issues. And it's a classroom seating assignment. And how are you going to set up? And we do that the first day of class. We do that in the middle of the semester. And then we do it at the end. And they have to label where they're having everyone sit and why. Um, and then they can, and they have to stay in the same group each time that they do it. So there's somebody who's the keeper of the information. And it's to see, was it a lucky guess the first time around? Or how are they going to do it differently? Any questions on that exercise? What's your intention? for them to recognize that your classroom setup is critical from the very beginning and to recognize that they all learn differently. No, 
Um, I when I teach smaller classes, <clears throat> I I I do a lot of case study work and. Um, I have them work in groups a lot, in teams, and so I want to start off the first day by having them work in teams, and um, and so we do team building. And so I'll do some team building exercises, and that could be anything from, you know, the marshmallow challenge. Yeah, so it could be the marshmallow challenge, or it could be... I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, you give, you break the students into groups, and then you give them one marshmallow, and um, I think it's 20 sticks of spaghetti, maybe it's 10 sticks of spaghetti and a piece of string and a little bit of tape and they have to um, they have to build the tallest tower that they can in 18 minutes and then you measure it and see who built the tallest tower. It has to be standing or standing. Anyway, that's the marshmallow challenge. And if you just Google it, there's a video on it. There was a TED talk on it. It was very funny and I, was, I used it the first time. It was, it was a lot of fun. But I'll also do things with really small class. It was still doing uh, okay. With a really small class of, you know, like some of the blindfolded activities. I used to do experiential education and outdoor education, and so I would do blindfold activities and things like that also. And with a really small class, it works great. But you certainly can't do that in a room with 150 students or even with 40 students. So when I'm down below 20, it is totally doable, and, you know, I can use blindfolds and have them, um, you know, uh, uh, put themselves into group uh, or into hierarchy based on birthdays or their ages or uh, you don't usually do ages but you know alphabetical <laughs> um, but things like that or you know where they're from geographically but they have to do a blindfold. And tell us your name again? Oh, Jesse Myler. And what school? Oh, I teach environmental science CAS. Okay. So are there any other, uh, who else does team building exercises or does a lot of teamwork in their class and thinks they m might benefit from doing team building exercises? Sonia. Probably also one that others know is how to use a paper clip, the many different ways that you can use a paper clip. There's online lists so you can Google that and um, it's actually a really nice uh, exercise to do in a, in a small group a little like she just mentioned and um, it's a, they don't need any equipment. They can just think of ways to use a paper clip and then I can give them a solution at the end and see you know, how much. And they, it can be a little bit of a competition how many you can come up with in a limited time. So it has some of this other thing that they mentioned earlier. Somebody mentioned about the competitiveness, et cetera. But they have to work in a team and then they recognize how much more they were able to think uh, in a team, uh, how many more uh, solutions they came up with. Do you ask them uh, to identify how many different solutions or? Yeah. Okay. And to think about what they've learned from the little exercise uh, in terms of team building. So reflection is also key and with two and a half hours you have that time. Well, what I did last semester which was very interesting was that I paired them into a group of two and after the first day of introduction I made them go to the campus and look for professors research post and then find some statistical language in it and report them on Blackboard and then also any information that they can find. What I'm trying to do is for them to assess themselves at the end of the class and go back to the same posting and see whether they can derive more information that they, 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 they can get more information from it compared to the first day of class. And if they can do that, then it will mean they've been able to learn something throughout the 15 weeks of the semester. And I think it was very interesting exercise. What's that? Where, where do they get the information? They go to all the buildings. It, it could be, they come to statistics as a, a core course, so they go to their field. Some are from computer science, some are from math, some are from. So you have to go to any building to, and I give them some ideas if you don't have any building to go. Here's, you can see professors posting, you can see. So just tell me the statistics component of the posting or the posters, and if you can find anything you find like um, research work of graduate students, of uh, professors that has been posted in the, in, in the building throughout the whole university. So they have to go and then you have, when you allow one person to do it, they can really formulate something and you might not have the time to check. So you put them in a group of two or three so that they can, you know, they, they, they trust to be built. And then they go around and then they report it on Blago at the end of the first week of class. Then getting to the 15th week, you let them go back to the same posting and then give you information so that things that they've learned throughout the class, they can now assess the impact that they've had as a result of being through the basic statistics course. I would add, ah, oh, damn, I just, Larry. I have a question. I teach online a lot, 
and I wonder if anyone has any suggestions for the online analog of what we've been discussing in terms of exercises. I teach online basic statistics, so I think we've met on a couple of training, yeah. And I do the same, I do what they call roll call. And with the roll call on Piazza, I, I allow them to introduce themselves. Why are you taking this course? Have you taken online course before? I get, ask them a series of questions. And then before then, too, I have um, a lot of questions to just draw information from them and know, and then tell them, do they have, it was during the summer, so do you have 15 uh, uh, hours a week in order to be able to go through the course. So I gave them the expectations and what they should expect from the class. So I do that also through uh, Piazza in posting. Anyone else have any other suggestions for online course? I can go without the pre -posting. I just would say you can do video introductions. So I, we actually use Canvas as a blackboard and it's got a really nice video interaction. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. That's why you have to make it a required assignment. With, with yeah, it's got to be requ required with points. But yeah, they they will they will chat. They'll post pictures, but they won't necessarily turn the webcam on. So if you want to start building community in the online form when they're never going to see each other as opposed to blended, um, forcing them to do that can help. Um, or recording their voice can help too. So you can switch it so they can do an image and a voice recording or something like that, just introducing themselves, and that can kind of help build some of that community, despite the fact that they're not going to actually see each other. So I want to honor the fact that I said I would give us a few times to talk to each other. The last thing I would say is that one other exercise is something I do in a course which is about democracy. I, ask, I do an exercise called shipwrecked. I don't know if you've heard of that, where I say there's 200 people, they were shipwrecked on an island, there's no chance of being discovered. The crew and captain have uh, been lost. And I break them up into groups and say, what are you going to do? And I have a, a handout that I can post if anyone's interested. But it, it says, um, will you form some sort of organization? If so, what kind? And uh, if not, you know, skip to number five and, and tell us why and how we'll decide. You know, then I said, how will it be organized? What will the, um, it, how will decisions be made, et cetera? What kind of leadership? And I use this because it gets at questions of human nature, questions of government, what kind of organization. They sometimes surprise, you know, they come in very cynical and then all of a sudden they're creating these, organi these uh, uh, organizations that are very consensual and based on a positive view of human nature. So I, it, I use it as a way to help get them to deal with sort of course content in a way that's sort of familiar to them, but uh, that I can then draw out and say, oh, you said that, but what would Hudson say to that now that we're three weeks in? So what I will point out to you is there's an organization, and maybe someone can help me. Or would you help hand some of these out, just pass them? <coughs> there's, there's an, I'll pass these two out. You can. There's an organization which is called a uh, group called Faculty Focus, and I would draw your attention to them. It's mentioned on the handout that I'm giving you, and they have lots of different exercises. There's a wonderful woman who runs their blog, Mary Ellen Weimer, uh, Mary Ellen Weimer on Faculty Focus, saying you can just Google them, and they list all sorts of exercises about teaching. I find they are the best blog around, the best organization. There is a conference that they have at the end, this year it's at the end of May, early June in Boston, which I hope to go to, and it's all about teaching. So to conclude, I would ask you to star something in your notes or take a moment to reflect, to think about one thing that you might adopt from the many wonderful ideas that you heard from everybody today. I call that, uh, I, I now, in IR we have something called R2P, the responsibility to protect. I have now call it P2R, which is pause to reflect. And I do that in my classes. In the middle of class, I will just say, uh, 
like everybody's all heated about something and sort of there's a, and I'll just say P2R and I make them write in their notebooks. Uh, just reflect and sort of pull things together. So. So thank you all. One last thing as a handout. I, I, I think participation, this isn't a whole other workshop, but I made 25 copies of a rubric. It's posted online on our Blackboard site. A man that, by the name of John Immerwar has pu published a fantastic rubric for participation. And it starts with listening. Second is preparation. Third is quality of contributions. Fourth is the impact on the seminar, and only last is frequency. <laughs> and I have shown this to my students, and it has really helped improve the level of classroom conversation. I also discussed this with my students, but on the second day of class, when we start to have a little bit more conversation. So I'll put those here. <laughs> if anyone would like that, it is posted to our Blackboard site. So thank you, one and all. I hope you have a great and Farron Conference, and if there's anyone you want to take a moment and find because you want more ideas from them, please use this time now. <laughs>